I just couldn't let this one go by without a video. This is the Batman. It's why I do what I do. Why is my wardrobe 40% Batman? Because you have to dress for the job that you want, not the job that you have. Now, I wanted to say that I have loved comic books long before I loved mythology. But that's not actually coherent, because comics are myth. At least the best of them get about as close to traditional myth as anything possibly can. And certain comic characters are the modern descendants of the mythic heroes of the past. They're modern manifestations of the hero archetype. If any comic characters deserve to be counted among the greatest heroes of legend and epic, I'd say Superman and Batman have to be at the top of that list. They're two of the most universally recognized pop culture icons. As characters, they're fun and fascinating, but each, as a symbol, is enduring. From Truth, Justice, and the American Way to Terror, Vengeance, and Hope, the comic book hero genre is a direct successor to the ancient, mythic, heroic tradition. The average superhero story is directed at a mature, maturing audience, adolescent to adult males historically, but the appeal is broadened to just about every demographic segment within society. And that's because they serve as more than just entertainment. They function in a way identical to ancient myth. They're pedagogical, inspirational. They provide a moral education and a transcendent experience, a sense of awe and wonder. Superheroic models are constructed along mythic lines, including the preservation of supernatural elements common to many sacred narratives and worldviews. They promote patterns of virtue and critique society and its values. And there's a traditional aspect to their tales, a living and organic development, the product of numerous artists and writers evolving over multiple generations. How many times has the story of the destruction of Krypton been told and retold? or the murder of Thomas and Martha Wayne. There's also the psychological spiritual impact of the superhero motif, the identification of the reader with the hero speaking to the inner man, allowing for the shedding of one persona and the assumption of a new, the mask motif, the secret identity. We can be other than we are. We can be better. We can live without fear speaks to the human need for salvation, our longing to save ourselves and others from the evil and suffering this world has to offer. Batman has always meant the most to me. Well, maybe not always. I grew up watching Adam West and the Super Friends. I enjoyed Batman, but you couldn't take him too seriously. And I definitely didn't find any inspiration in the character. If I was going to play superheroes when I was a kid, I wasn't going to be Batman. I was going to be the Flash. Because when you're six or seven years old, you're fast. Batman was too lame. He didn't do anything. Then I read the comics. I came across some old detective comics issues written by Dennis O'Neill and illustrated by Neil Adams. This was not the character from TV. It was dark. It was serious. It was compelling. Batman was the self-made hero. He hung out with all the overpowered superheroes, but he wasn't a superhero. He was smart, he was strong, and he pushed himself to his limits. The ultimate quest for virtue, to actualize one's human potential. He traveled the world studying with the greatest minds and mentors. He learned everything he could from languages to forensics, military science. He studied and mastered numerous martial arts. He became the world's greatest detective. He was inspirational. There was something believable about the Batman, something attainable in the example that he set. Not that I thought that I could one day run around a city jumping across rooftops or taking on organized crime in my spare time, or even that Bruce Wayne was the paragon of sanity. Well, a guy dresses up like a bat clearly has issues. No, it was the drive to excel, to become something greater. The laser-like focus on achieving a goal, that was inspirational. I was so excited when Tim Burton's Batman came out in 1989. Finally, we had a Batman that was going to be closer to the character the comic fans were familiar with. Closer, but still not there. I loved Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns and Batman Year One, still two of my all-time favorite stories. Hollywood never got it quite right. After Burton, it actually got it quite wrong. That is, until Christopher Nolan took on the character and nailed it. Perfect story. Perfect atmosphere. Perfect attitude. And the cast? Perfect. Couldn't have been better. Here was Batman, the archetypal hero. This was the perfect expression of the hero myth. The transformation of man. Descending and rising again. 
struggling against fear and guilt, the devotion to an ideal, becoming more than just a man. A legend. A symbol, something incorruptible, something that transcended the man behind the mask. A symbol that could, in the end, be passed on and lived to inspire. How do you top the trilogy? I didn't know if it was possible. Batman v Superman? It had some great moments. The scene where he goes to rescue Martha! Without a doubt, the best combat scene in any Batman movie, bar none. Ben Affleck's older, darker Batman was aiming at the Frank Miller version of the Dark Knight. But again, something was missing. And I'm not even thinking about the ridiculous un-Batman-like body count. But myths are traditional tales. They grow over time, being reimagined again and again to meet the needs of each generation and society, to address the concerns of a culture, to revisit those deep and abiding questions of human existence. So now we have The Batman, directed by Matt Reeves. I had mixed feelings going in. Going back to Batman's early years, I thought that was a good idea. I heard early on that they took some inspiration from Miller's Batman Year One and Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale's The Long Halloween. And if done right, it could have a similar dark and gritty feel. But casting the Batman, I have always been a skeptic. I wasn't happy when I heard they cast Keaton. Let's not even talk about Clooney. But Robert Pattinson? When I look at him, I still see Cedric Diggory, not Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne would definitely be a Gryffindor. I figure this guy's going to need to hit the gym, like, big time. Maybe some serious steroids. I don't know. I mean, go for it. Because Batman has to be, you know, bigger. Of course, when I saw the trailer and Pattinson in the suit, I started to relax a bit. No, scratch that. I started to get excited. It was reminiscent of Lee Bermejo's Batman Damned costume crossed with Mike Mignola's Gotham by Gaslight look. So, let's talk the Batman. And warning, there are going to be some spoilers. One of the first things that struck me was how we're given Batman's inside perspective. We get into his head a bit more. And not just through his actions, reactions, and expressions, or the normal interaction and dialogue with other characters. Nolan did a fantastic job of creating a compelling Batman with emotional depth. But Batman doesn't talk very much. He's not known for emoting or sharing his feelings. And the comics always had an advantage over the movies in that they give us thought bubbles and blocks of narration to take us inside. I love the way Batman becomes the narrator in the film. Fear is a tool. But when that light hits the sky, it's not just a call. It's a warning. Through his journal. It's very Captain Kirk, very Rorschach. And all the whores and politicians will look up and shout, Save us. And I'll whisper, No. Very cool. Very Batman year one. Batman is the focus. We never forget this. Bruce Wayne plays a part, but the majority of the film, he remains in the mask. There's more Batman from start to finish here than in any other Batman movie, period. But here's what Matt Reeve brought to the screen that had been missing from every other earlier incarnation. The Dark Knight Detective. The Batman is both a trickster myth and a detective story. The missing element of the Batman mythos in film has always been the detective side of the character. He is the world's greatest detective. He premiered in Detective Comics number 27 back in 1939. This is where DC got its name. We finally get a battle elevated above the physical. That's a tongue twister. Adding the cerebral to the psychological, the mystery to the emotion, like Nolan's Batman had a baby with Sherlock Holmes. Of course, all without skimping on the kick-ass martial arts that makes Batman, Batman. And it was extraordinary. Now, the trickster is a precursor to the hero. The trickster archetype is often called the trickster hero, and his essential nature is that of the intelligent transformative fool. The trickster brings about change initiating transformation, which is also why he often takes on the role of the villain or adversary in a hero story. The trickster introduces chaos in the midst of order, challenging society and its conventions, prompts us to question the established order, which, when the order is corrupt, is a necessity. But he's also liminal, 
pushes against the boundaries, the rules, to see how far is too far. And tricksters often go to extremes, and that's when the villain truly emerges. The hero, by comparison, is also transformative. Changing society, yes, but more directly as a very locus of transformation, his own. The hero struggles against chaos to bring order, for society to tame the wild and cultivate civilization, and in himself to let the boy die and rise again a man. The hero provides a better order, perfecting it, weeding out corruption. And he too is liminal, standing on and crossing over boundaries. He's the guardian of order between nature out there and culture in here, defending civilization from the wild. Like a demigod, one foot in each realm, he descends into the abyss to rise again, willing to endure death, willing to die to become something greater, the master of two worlds, as Campbell would put it. In the Batman, we get a battle of the intellect, chaos versus order. Gotham represents order, but the order is corrupt. More disordered the deeper you look. Chaos creeping in at every level. Anyone who knows Gotham knows this. The Batman's trying to bring order out of this chaos. And not just in a city, but also within himself. Now, the trickster, as I said, is marked by his intellect. The fool who tries to fool others, to outwit, to deceive. And since the intellect is naturally ordered to pursue truth, this act is another element of chaos. Here's Set, Prometheus, Loki, Satan in the Garden of Paradise. In fact, all human knowing as an act of the intellect, a pursuit of truth, is a movement from chaos to order, if you think about it, as we struggle to make sense of the world and ourselves. Chaos is the disordered mind, a worldview filled with contradiction, the frustration of not seeing how things fit together, how reality coheres, confusion when the pieces of the puzzle don't fit. And that's just it. It's a puzzle. And this implies there are pieces and that they do fit. The problem is that knowing involves pain, struggle, and strength. The ability to hold on, to grasp something, the form out there. And if we can endure, we become something more. And this parallels the Batman's relationship with many of his trickster adversaries. Of course, the Joker, he's the quintessential trickster. Joaquin Phoenix version, brilliant, amazingly acted, but he's more swept along into the chaos, oftentimes not knowing himself what's real and what's true. The Dark Knight version, on the other hand, Heath Ledger, perfect. Manipulating chaos, using chaos. He's an agent of chaos. <laughs> he's a schemer. I'm not a schemer. Contrary to his protests, he wants to see how far we can be pushed before we become like him until our self-interest overpowers our respect for moral duty, until idealism surrenders to nihilism. Will Batman take off the mask, put aside the symbol in order to live his ideals, to save the people? Or will he betray his mission out of self-interest to preserve his mask and corrupt the symbol? In the end, he chooses to allow the symbol to be corrupted to save the city, an unfortunately dense reputation as Gotham's white knight of justice, perpetrating the noble lie this time, we have the Riddler. Thankfully, not an over-the-top buffoon. I mean, he's not a court jester. He's not a comedian. Jokes are not the same as riddles. Humor can be critical, prompting awareness and change, but riddles test and obscure. They make us struggle to grow. He's an enigma. All this talk of puzzles, I think, begins to fit into place. Batman and the Riddler are both marked by brilliance. Locked in a battle of wits, like I said, an intellectual competition. It's hero versus shadow. The adversary is the catalyst of transformation, the one who prompts the hero to change, the challenge without which the heroic virtues couldn't manifest. The Riddler was never one of my favorite rogues, but he is the perfect adversary to bring out that one underutilized characteristic of the Batman, the detective. Let's play a game, just me and you. The one who solves riddles. And when handled in this way, as opposed to this, <laughs> it's compelling. DC Comics meets Seven. What's in the box? The Riddler is Batman's shadow. In Jungian terms, the character that manifests the dark, negative, or hidden aspects of the psyche. Like Ra's al Ghul in The Scarecrow and Batman Begins, each paralleling Bruce's struggle with fear, and Ra's especially paralleling Bruce's guilt and hatred of corruption. 
The Riddler is the perfect shadow of this incarnation of the Batman. Edward Nashton, not Nigma, is Bruce Wayne's negative reflection. Before the Batman, an original movie novel helps set up the relationship between these two figures. Now, as a novel, there's a lot to be desired. Yeah, hey, this is marketing, and yes, I fell for it. We learn that he was an orphan like Bruce. He lived in Wayne Manor, which had been turned into an orphanage. Yet he resents Bruce Wayne. He's jealous of him, like Set of Osiris or Loki of Balder. When young Bruce awkwardly tries to smile at him in one scene, he reads it as sneering condescension. Here's a boy born to privilege. He's an underprivileged boy. And he interprets the world through economic disparity and his personal despair. Bruce Wayne, poor little rich boy, he's not a real orphan. He's shown all the pity when his parents are killed, but he never actually knew a day of real suffering in his entire life. Well, real orphans are crammed in to sleep 30 to a room. Where is the justice? And he grows up seeing the wealthy getting away with their corruption. The Gotham Renewal Project, the Wayne Fortune, which was set aside to aid the underprivileged, being stolen by corrupt politicians and civil servants. Where is the justice? It's coming. In a way, it's the Batman that unites Wayne and Nashton. Perhaps symbolically represented by the shadowy underworld of the Batcave, which literally unites their two worlds. It's an abandoned private subterranean rail line linking Wayne Tower, the upper world of privilege, where Bruce grew up, with Wayne Manor, the orphanage where Nashton is raised. And hiding behind their masks, their dark alter egos also have similar goals, to fight corruption or unmask a corrupt system. Batman wants justice, but he paints himself as vengeance. He wants the guilty to pay for their crimes, and in a universe where Joe Chill was never caught, this haunts him. He tries to create order out of that chaos. The Riddler wants social vengeance, though he calls it justice. He wants everybody to pay for the crimes of a few. But in Gotham, of course, there's plenty of guilt to go around. And he sees himself standing against an entirely corrupt system, bringing chaos to a failed order. He wants to reveal the truth about the cesspool of Gotham. But the two differ most when it comes to method. The Riddler steps over the boundaries, as tricksters must, crosses the line that the Batman straddles. And that line is the one between justice and vengeance. This has always been the central question of Batman's motivation. What drives him? Nolan explored the theme brilliantly, I think, in Batman Begins. Bruce's near attempt on the life of Joe Chill, Rachel as his moral conscience, the temptation of League of Shadows. But this film handles the theme differently. Batman is vengeance. It's his catchphrase. It was obvious, even in the trailers, how they changed the answer to the question, What are you? What the hell are you? The hell are you supposed to be? From the classic, I'm Batman. I'm Batman. To, I'm Vengeance. Of course, this wasn't without precedent, as those familiar with Batman the Animated Series know. I am Vengeance. I am the Knight. I am... And I fully expected this younger, less experienced Batman to be walking a dangerously thin line, wrestling with his temptation to kill. Take it easy, sweetheart. And don't get me wrong, the Batman is brutal in this film. But I was pleasantly surprised to see his traditional commitment to not taking a life, consciously aware not to cross that line and acting to save others from doing the same. Selena, don't throw your life away. This is a more stoic Batman. Just look at him in the mask. It's cold, in control, the embodiment of apatheia. Well, 90% of the 80% of the time. No, the distinction between vengeance and justice is explored in the relationship between the Batman and the Riddler. Again, the parallel between the two is stark. Our first glimpse of each is as they emerge from the darkness, followed by raw violence, each delivering a brutal beating each conveying a message. Batman speaks of vengeance. The Riddler speaks of justice. It can be cruel, poetic, or blind. But when it's denied, it's your violence you may find. Justice. The answer is justice. The major difference is the Riddler leaves behind a corpse. 
We later discover that the Riddler was inspired to vengeance by the Batman. Batman sees the Riddler as an adversary. But in his naivete, creating this reputation as a creature of the night, striking terror into the hearts of a superstitious and cowardly lot as this symbol of vengeance, the Riddler comes to see the Dark Knight as something akin to a natural ally and uses him as such to accomplish his goal of ultimately bringing Falcone into the light. The Riddler's vision of vengeance is not ordered by a code. It viciously crosses every single line. But that line can be blurry because justice and vengeance are more similar than we care to admit. Is revenge a form of justice? Plato is one of the first to tackle the question of justice and revenge. To put his perspective into context, Plato connects his view of punishment with his theory that nobody voluntarily does evil, only out of ignorance. He says, No one punishes the evildoer under the notion or for the reason that he has done wrong. Only the unreasonable fury of a beast acts in that manner. But he who desires to inflict rational punishment does not retaliate for a past wrong, which cannot be undone. He has regard to the future, and is desirous that the man who is punished, and he who sees him punished, may be deterred from doing wrong again. He punishes for the sake of prevention. Elsewhere, and beside the compensation of the wrong, let a man pay a further penalty for the chastisement of the offense, not that he's punished because he did wrong, for that which is done can never be undone, but in order that in future times he and those who see him corrected may utterly hate injustice, or at any rate, abate much their evil doing. So for him, the goal is always deterrence. If we're rational, we seek to prevent future evil. Revenge is contrary to reason. It's the act of a beast. Aristotle, on the other hand, had a more sophisticated analysis of revenge, which he treats in a number of different places. He describes it as a desire attending an emotion. Anger is accompanied by a desire for revenge, which is a pleasure, aroused by an intentional and undeserved slight. And it entails three further desires. The desire to cause the offender pain, the desire for the offender to know we are the cause of the pain, and the desire for the offender to know that he brought it upon himself. But that's just the first of three purposes for revenge. Retribution, to make the offender suffer while we enjoy the pleasure. The second, restoration, to reestablish a sense of honor and social status. And the third, or main purpose, is deterrence, to ensure that we are not mistreated in the future. So it's not merely about pleasure in the offender's suffering. The desire for revenge is not some base desire to destroy the offender. Killing or utterly ruining somebody's reputation, that would be more of an act of hatred. Revenge is analogous to punishment. In that, agreeing with Plato, punishment has the same goal of dissuading future bad behavior. So what about justice and the idea of retribution? Laws require enforcement. Behind every law is a bullet, which presupposes a right to punish. Punitive justice serves to restore a balance to the order upset by a crime. But it's applicable only to those capable of moral choice, which is why children are not tried as adults, and those who are actually insane, like the Joker, are placed at Arkham rather than at Blackgate. Punishment in these cases might have similar means, but they definitely have different ends, such as training or simply restraining. Now, there are three goals for a just punishment that parallel what we find in revenge. Retribution, again, paying back the criminal for the crime, that's a response to past action which reestablishes the balance of justice that's been upset and reasserts the authority of the law. Second, we have correction, to improve or rehabilitate the offender. And third, deterrence, to prevent similar crimes, both of which are aimed at future benefits. Unfortunately, these aren't always attainable. Perfect retribution implies some type of restitution, and that's not always possible. Some things can never be restored. Money, yes. Honor, maybe. Life, no. There is no Lazarus pit in the real world. Capital and punishment can never correct, and some criminals can never be deterred. And it's mistaken to think that restitution itself reestablishes justice. Restitution is not the same as retribution. It's compensation. It at best restores things to a previous state when that's even possible. But it doesn't involve a payment for a crime as a crime. It's part of the retributive aspect of punishment, but only part. And because the crime is an offense to the law as well as to the victim, Vengeance can't be a private affair. The victim is not entitled to more than compensation. The state, however, holds the right to extract retribution for the assault on the law and the duty to try to reform and deter crime, which raises the question of the moral status of vigilantism. 
we have a natural tendency to sympathize with or even root for the vigilante hero operating outside or even against the law. He's after the justice that we find so elusive in the real world. And he's not hampered by the strictures of the law. It's pure passion, idealism. He hurts people who deserve to be hurt. And we love it. I confess. I kidnapped her. I killed her. Arrest me. What? Arrest me! I did it! I said I did it! Christ! I need help! No, don't! Don't do that! Take me in! No! No! Men get arrested. Blocks get put down. But is this justice? The Riddler sees himself as a victim who's owed more than restitution. He's the judge, the jury, the executioner. The law doesn't factor in except as an obstacle. The law can't be trusted. It's part of the problem. His vengeance is a private matter, which he tries to turn into a public movement, which partly succeeds because vengeance does inspire as the Batman learns to his regret. The Batman, even if he operates outside the law, at least allies with it. He works with Gordon as a partner. And in the end, he always leaves things in the hands of the law. He wants retribution, and it can't be personal. Retribution and vengeance can look similar, but retribution is not mere revenge. Revenge seeks that emotional pleasure by inflicting pain on an enemy. Retribution seeks justice. Batman understands a bit too late in the movie that he can't remain a symbol of vengeance. He needs to become a symbol of justice, or better, a symbol of hope. And out of the three goals of punitive justice, retribution, correction, deterrence, retribution in the final analysis has to remain the central feature because justice is about balance and balance entails proportionality. Vengeance does not. We can't eliminate the retributive function of a punishment and limit it to correction and deterrence. Because if punishment is to be justified, it has to be based on retribution. If there is no retribution, any punishment would be immoral. All punishment would be immoral. It would be like inflicting punishment without a crime. Because you know, deep down, you deserve to be punished. If the goal was purely corrective and deterrent, we could punish any person simply for their own good or to scare others, whether they're guilty or not. And if we could further improve somebody's behavior through fear, or greatly deter crime with more and more extreme and brutal punishments, then why not? Why not proportion justice to these goals? No, retribution ties punishment to the guilty and limits the extent to the crime, no matter the good that could be attained otherwise. This is the difference between the Batman and the Riddler. This is why Batman is not the Punisher. He may have a code against killing, but it's not because heroes don't kill. There's an entire history of heroism that debunks that idea, from Gilgamesh to Aeneas to Lancelot. Should he kill the Joker? We've been asking that for decades. Why on God's earth is he still alive? Someone should. That would be the utilitarian solution. But should it be Batman? I mean, he has a reason for not killing. And I don't think it's because he believes it's a categorical duty not to. And I also know it's not because killing can make him as bad as those he fought no matter how many times this might be said, because it wouldn't. There's a huge difference between a psychopathic serial killer clown and whoever decides to put him down, like Miller's version of the Dark Knight. No, I think it goes back to one of the fundamental and essential heroic characteristics, the hero as a model of virtue and values. Heroes exemplify the values of their society, and the Batman is a classic example of an American hero. He might not be some star-spangled patriot or a big blue boy scout, but he nonetheless embodies traditional American and Western values like hope and the sanctity of human life. The film actually gave serious attention to his concern for the lives of others, especially during the purifying deluge sent to wash the world of Gotham clean. Talk about myth and symbolism. If it came to choosing between capturing the villain and saving the innocent, Batman always comes down on the side of the innocent. But deeper than societal values are the universal human virtues recognized by great thinkers such as Plato, Cicero, Ambrose, Augustine, and beyond, called the cardinal virtues. There is the intellectual virtue known as prudentia in Latin, or wisdom. The Batman definitely has the ability to see and choose the proper course of action. So if you want to make virtue a second nature, ask yourself daily, what would Batman do? 
It's not who I am underneath. But what I do that defines me. Then there's the moral virtue known as fortitudo, or bravery. Not only the primary characteristic of heroes in general, but central to the Batman persona in his conquest of fear. If you didn't notice it, it was one of the major themes in the Nolan trilogy, especially in Batman Begins and The Dark Knight Rises. But the last two may relate most to his moral code. Justitia, or justice, which I already discussed, and Temperantia. The Batman doesn't kill because part of him wants to. It'd be too damned easy to give in to the temptation. And even though it wouldn't reduce him to the moral equivalent of a death stroke, a joker, or a riddler, it still damages the human soul. Just look at Voldemort. Or go back and notice what he says to Selina Kyle when she attempts to kill Falcone. He doesn't care about saving Falcone. He cares about saving her. She says, He has to pay! And his response is, You don't have to pay with him. You paid enough. No, Batman doesn't kill because he exerts self-control. He's the epitome of discipline. And if there's one thing he wants to master, it's himself. Another thing this movie explores in a new way, I think, is the father-son relationship. A pervasive theme and myth with its stories of abandoned and orphaned children and violent generational struggle. Everyone knows the origin story of the Batman, so the decision not to revisit the death of Thomas and Martha Wayne in the typical way, I think, was a good move. The mystery of identity is always tied in some way to the hero's paternity. There's some question or lack of knowledge. And they introduce that element in this story in a unique way. The opening scene sets the stage. We think we're watching young Bruce and his father. Fun, playful, innocent. And then it turns into a nightmare murder scene, leaving behind a traumatized boy. You can even feel the Batman's empathy through the mask when he looks into the face of the child, his own face. The child's father was the mayor of Gotham, and we come to find out that he was just as corrupt as his city. The illusion of innocence is shattered. The twist is that the parallels might run even deeper than we first suspect. Thomas Wayne was running for mayor when he and his wife were killed. And after decades, a dark side to their story emerges. Political corruption, ties to organized crime. Bruce still has the perspective of a child with regards to his father. His relationship never evolved beyond the idealized memory of his youth. So his world is thrown into utter chaos yet again. And he needs to discover who his real father was to understand his own identity. Was he a good man? Or was that just a mask? After all, it is a movie about masks. What lies hidden beneath, the corruption they conceal, and the truths that they reveal. So what did this movie do right? A lot. It gave us the Dark Knight Detective, perhaps for the first time. It explored the nature of vengeance and justice in a compelling way. But most of all, it stayed true to the character's values. As brutal as the Batman is, and as dark and twisted as is the evil he fights, he never compromises those values, or abandons his code, or steps across that line. And maybe best of all, Matt Reeves paid homage to the comics, giving some neat nods to his source material and the fans. I'm not going to give a list of Easter eggs here, but you couldn't miss his tribute to Loeb and Sales The Long Halloween. The first of a series of murders takes place when? Halloween night. We find Carmen Falcone at the center of a detective story, which fortunately doesn't drag on for an entire year. And we even learn that Dr. Wayne once saved Falcone's life, all of that from The Long Halloween. Or his tribute to Loeb and Lee's Batman Hush. The meeting between Batman and the Riddler at Arkham near the end was intended to make us think the Riddler knew Batman's identity. And if he didn't catch it, he didn't. And Selena Kyle, her appearance was clearly modeled on the miller Mazzucchelli version from Batman Year One. The same short hair, the same questionable taste in clothes, but at least here she wasn't a prostitute. Her relationship with Falcone also has a new and interesting twist, which I won't spoil, but I loved the fact that she still leaves her claw marks in his face. Overall, if I had to rate the movie on a scale from Apollonius to Virgil, I would have to give it a homer. It's about as close to a perfect Batman movie as we've had. There are some things that it does better, but does it surpass the Nolan trilogy? I don't know. I'd have to see it a few more times and give it some more thought, but it's close. And they clearly left it open for a potential sequel, even if they didn't set it up quite as well as they did at the end of Batman Begins. But judging by how this film is being received, I'm sure it's going to get one. And the sooner, the better. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure you leave a comment. And thanks for watching.